How many of you remember your high school or college literature courses and remember the Grand Inquisitor? Show of hands. A uh, couple. Just don't give us a test on our uh, there, there, There's going to be a quiz at your ascension, but I'm not giving it. <laughs> For me, the year between the spring of 1979 and the spring of 1980 was the year of the Grand Inquisitor. <laughs> I had to read that chapter from Dostoevsky's last novel, The Brothers Karamazov, first published in 1880, no fewer than three times in those 12 to 14 months. The first time was as part of my high school AP, or Advanced Placement, European History course, probably because it shows Dostoevsky's reading of the spiritual state of Russia a generation before the Russian Revolution. I don't actually remember much about the experience other than having to read the story. I'm sorry, but it apparently didn't make more of an impression on me at that time than that. Then over the summer, I got a standalone copy of The Grand Inquisitor as part of my freshman orientation packet from Guilford College. The booklet was a summer assignment for my upcoming IDS 101 class, the theme of which would be freedom. I can still remember the, uh, one of the other texts, free from what to do what. <laughs> Most of the colleges at the time had the equivalent of freshman IDS or interdisciplinary studies. The idea of such classes was to start the four year process of convincing the students of the extent of the things that they didn't actually know. I knew more going into college than I knew coming out of it. And, but the most important thing was that I didn't know nearly as much going in as I had thought I had. <laughs> the, diff the difference, of course, was that now I had some idea of the total body of knowledge and how much bigger it was than I had ever thought it was or those parts that I had been exposed to. That was in the fall semester of 1979. The next spring, my freshman English class had to read the entire Brothers Karamazov, which we usually referred to as the Brothers K because we could never quite remember whether it was Karamazov uh, Kar Karamazov or Karamazov. And for your information, when I was writing this message, I found more online examples of people who seem to agree with that last pronunciation than for either of the others. So Karamazov is the one I'm sticking with, at least for now. The last time I mentioned the brothers Karamazov in a message was in July of last year. And Jennifer actually <laughs> remembered it, which surprised me because I remember doing it. I just couldn't remember when I had done it. I said, it's one of those books that's supposed to be about one thing, a murder mystery, but it's actually about something else entirely, the philosophical and spiritual state of late 19th century Russia. The novel's basic plot is simple enough. Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov is a rich landowner with a bad drinking habit, and he seems to be what they call a mean drunk. He has three sons, or what is it four, from two marriages. The oldest, Dmitri, who is also called Mitya, is the only son of the first marriage and the one most like his father, with whom Mitya has been known to get into fights. Ivan, or Vanya, the older son of the second marriage, is the philosophical one, while Alexei, almost always called Alyosha, just 20, is the religious one. And then there's Pavel Smerdyakov, who's rumored to be the result of a drunken one-night stand between Fyodor Pavlovich and Smerdyakov's mother, a mute and probably homeless woman 
known all around town as Stinking Lizaveta. When Fyodor Pavlovich is found murdered, Mitya is arrested and tried for the crime, although he stoutly protests his innocence. Against this backdrop, Ivan and Alyosha, the sons of the second marriage, who aren't that close initially, find their relationship deepening. And during the course of one of Alyosha's visits to his brother, Ivan tells Alyosha the story of the Grand Inquisitor, which he describes as a poem he's been working on in his head and which goes like this. In 16th century Seville, during what Ivan calls the most terrible time of the Inquisition, Christ returns temporarily, just in time to halt a funeral proce procession at the cathedral steps in Seville and raise the deceased, a seven-year-old little girl, from the dead. Also in the crowd is an old man, almost 90, wearing the robe of a monk, the Grand Inquisitor. He swoops in with his guards who arrest Christ without so much as a murmur of protest from the crowd, all of whom are too scared of the old man to do anything other than bow low before him. He blesses them in silence and moves on. That night, the old man comes alone to the prisoner's jail cell with a light in his hand. He stands in the doorway for a moment after the door clinks shut, gazing at the prisoner's face. And then the old man sets his lantern on the table in the room and speaks. Most of the rest of the chapter consists of the old man's diatribe against his prisoner, and since this is based on a reading of the temptation of Christ by the devil, I think we should pause for a moment to look at that story as found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and he said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Begone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Luke's account of the temptation, which isn't followed by Dostoevsky, has the events in a different order, stones to bread, worldly power in return for worshiping the devil and then jumping off the temple. And it ends the following way, which is Luke 4.13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That sentence reminds me of what one of my professors once said about it. The time of Jesus was a special time. In theological terms, the time of Jesus was kairos, which you might call an opportune moment, the, the day that you, ha that you have to seize, or even the time of grace, whereas ordinary time is chronos, which is the root of our words like chronology. There have been any number of sermons and hymns about how time spent in the presence of Jesus is a special time. Anybody else remember 
There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, and so on. I also remember the scandalized reaction of one of my co-workers years ago when I pointed out to him that Jesus could have said yes when he was tempted by the devil. If not, those weren't really temptations because they weren't, well, tempting. It's kind of the definition of the word. I could also quote Hebrews 4.15 at him, and he was the sort for whom proof texting meant a lot more than it does to any of us. But for, just for your records, it says, For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. In other words, there's no point to the story if there was no possibility that Jesus could agree to the offer. Beyond that, there's a name for saying that Jesus couldn't agree to the offer when he was tempted, and it's docetism. I like to think of it this way. Remember those old commercials on TV for cough syrup where the actor says, I'm not a real doctor, but I play one on TV? Well, the docetic heresy says something like, Jesus wasn't a real human being, but he played one on TV. <laughs> Apparently, my co-worker wasn't as small o orthodox as he liked to think he was. In any case, when you look at the temptations that are mentioned, you can discern quite a few patterns. The Grand Inquisitor speaks of them as miracle, mystery, and authority. Benjamin Kramer, who, one of whose online posts was one of my inspirations this morning, mentions selfishness, arrogance, and the worship of power. I agree with Kramer to a certain extent, especially on that last part, but I think it's more useful to look at the story this way. Yes, turning stones into bread when you're hungry can be read in terms of selfishness, but it's also true that if you can turn stones into bread for yourself, you can also do it for other people. And the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ that people will follow anybody who feeds them. Seest thou these stones in this parched and barren wilderness? Turn them into bread and mankind will run after thee like a flock of sheep, grateful and obedient, though forever trembling, lest thou withdraw thy hand and deny them thy bread. Moving on to the second temptation, jumping off the highest point of the temple and surviving the experience without getting so much as a scratch would certainly draw focus, as we say in the theater. It would be Jesus setting himself up as a rival God rather than waiting for the exaltation God gives him at the resurrection. <clears throat> And it leads directly into that final temptation, which is much more direct, raw, naked power manifested immediately. And yet another quote from Benjamin Kramer sums up the Christian view of the situation nicely. It will forever baffle me how someone could see how Jesus laid down his life out of love for the world rather than forcing it to conform to his will, then somehow conclude that the political and theological authoritarianism is how his followers should represent him in the world. On the other hand, it's hard to think of anyone, real or fictional, who would disagree with Kramer more than the Grand Inquisitor, although far too many people in this country who call themselves Christians would agree with the Inquisitor, at least in practical terms. For when the old man is facing Christ across that table in the latter's cell, he tells Christ that all he managed to do by rejecting the offer of the wise and dread spirit in the wilderness was to condemn humanity to ages of misery. People don't want to be free. In fact, they'll do almost anything to escape from the burden of misery imposed on them 
by freedom and choice. In other words, according to the Inquisitor, Christ overestimated humanity, for they are slaves, of course, though rebellious by nature. But fortunately, at least according to the Grand Inquisitor, when Christ returned to heaven, he left the church the power to bind and loose in his name. And in that power, the Inquisitor and others like him have taken the sword of Caesar and in taking it, of course, have rejected thee, Christ, and followed him, the devil. We shall triumph and shall be Caesars, and then we shall plan the universal happiness of man. Sound familiar? Not that Dostoevsky agrees with the Inquisitor, although Ivan Karamazov, the character in the novel who's telling this story, does. In fact, Ivan is an atheist precisely because he agrees with the ethical teachings of the Christian religion, yet he can't square these teachings and the message of a loving God with all the suffering in the world. At the end of the story of the Grand Inquisitor, you get the impression that this has been Ivan's way all along of telling his religious brother Alyosha why I am not a Christian, to borrow a phrase from another author. Christ, who's listened to the old man in complete silence, walks over to the Inquisitor and kisses him on the lips. And then, and then the old man opens the door and sends Christ out into the night, warning him never to return because he has said all he has a right to say. At this point, Alyosha asks his brother about the fate of the old man, and Yvonne replies, the kiss glows in his heart, but the old man adheres to his idea. You get the feeling that Yvonne is telling his little brother that he doesn't see himself changing his mind about religion. The classical answer to Yvonne's dilemma, of course, is that we are meant to that we are meant to continue Christ's work of repairing the world and that we're supposed to be servants in the world and not rule over it one of the most poignant moments in Luke's gospel happens at the last <laughs> supper and it is so poignant precisely because it happens just at the moment when Jesus is about to offer himself in sacrifice for others. Luke writes, a dispute also arose among them, which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For which is the greater, the one who sits at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? But I am among you as one who serves, which is Luke 22, 24 to 27. Now, when Benjamin Kramer comes to the crux of his argument, that our response to the election ahead of us, yes, I mentioned the elephant in the room, which will finish in just over two days from now, our response should resemble Jesus' responses to being tempted in the desert. And he uses Paul's admonition in Philippians 2 that your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or seized or clutched. The verb is, at the, is the same root as the term harpy. If you remember your mythology, the harpies swooped in and seized. Okay? But he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
I realize that it isn't easy to jump directly from the example of Jesus, who deliberately turned away from political power, to figuring out who should be trusted with political power in an election. As Douglas Adams writes in The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, the major problem, one of the, one of the major problems, for there are several, one of the many major problems with governing people is that of whom you get to do it, or rather of who manages to get people to let them do it to them. To summarize, it is a well-known fact that those people who must want to rule people are, ipso facto, those least suited to do it. To summarize the summary, Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should on no account be allowed to do the job. To summarize the summary of the summary, people are a problem. Oh. All kidding aside, it's neither my place nor my intent to tell you who to vote for. That being said, I have to agree with the people who say that you should vote your values, believe it or not. But remember, by their fruits, you shall know them and all of that. But what I don't hear many of these people quoting is Matthew 23, 23, where Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. If you want to vote your values, you can do a lot worse than starting with Jesus' values of justice, mercy, and faith. I've been a fan of the old TV series Seventh Heaven for years now. If you aren't familiar, the central character, Eric Camden, is a minister in one of those community churches. Eric's wife is named Annie, and they're the parents of five, later seven children. Annie is quite an intelligent woman, and although she has several degrees, she chooses to raise her family rather than work outside the home. Other people besides Eric and their children also recognize Annie's talents, and this brings her opportunities to serve. In a first season episode called Faith, Hope, and the Bottom Line, the trustees choose Annie to be the church's acting treasurer. And this is how she prefaces her, her presentation of the church budget for the next year. This has been a week filled with choices. The church's annual budget underscores, I think, exactly how costly those choices can be. We've also talked this week about the need for sound business versus the need for compassion. Ironically, it's the church's budget that gives us our first and best place to talk about the business of compassion. The budget is a series of credits and debits, projections and returns, but it's more than that. It's a moral document. We don't see it this way because we tend to put money on one side values on the other, and assume they never meet. But they do in the budget. How we invest our money is a direct reflection of the choices we make day in and day out. If you want to know our values, look to the budget. It'd be easier if we were dealing with money. We've all lost money. It is our faith and hope that we fear losing most because they're so hard to come by and nearly impossible to replace. Hmm. But we lower our risk by investing in each other, our community and our faith. The budget, this budget, is where we decide what kind of people we want to be. It isn't just in church budgets where we decide what kind of people we want to be. It's also in each of the individual choices we make moment by moment, hour by hour, day after day, year after year. We decide in the voting booth what kind of country we want to be for at least the next two years. 
Whether we choose to follow selfishness, arrogance, and the worship of power, like the Grand Inquisitor, or we choose to humble ourselves and be servants of others, like Christ. But in any case, the choice is ours. <laughs>